And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything ETF. I'm your host, Bob Fazzani. Thematic ETFs are hot, hot, hot. Right now, we're going to dig into that. Corporate bond ETFs on fire. We're going to talk about that as well. And the IPO market's hot as well. We're going to show you how to get in on that on top of all the other topics. Once again, two of the best people in the business joining us today. Chris Hempstead, head of ETF uh, Institutional Business Development over at New York Life. Todd Rosenbluth, director of ETF and Mutual Fund Research at CFRA. Todd, let me start with you. Uh, I keep looking at these thematic ETFs. We used to make a joke about this. You know, it started with Bitcoin, then it went to pot ETFs. Uh, Tech themes, tech thematic themes, artificial intelligence, social media, cloud computing are all catching on. Um, they've replaced sort of plain vanilla indexed ETFs uh, as a darling. And I guess, why not? They capture the zeitgeist, uh, don't they? What is it that's appealing about these thematic ETFs? Well, we're currently in an environment where everyone is working from home for the most part and doing school perhaps from home. And so some of these themes fit in very well. You've got cloud computing themes, ETFs like WCLD from Wisdom Tree and CLOU from Global X. You've got cybersecurity products like CIBR from First Trust, robotics like BOTZ. These are in the more the tech space. But thematic in general, you've seen healthcare oriented thematic ETFs from ARC or climate change oriented ETFs like ICLN from iShares has gained popularity. We really think thematic ETFs are here to stay. They're not only a replacement for this, some of the sector ETFs you talked about, but if you're an old stock jockey, uh, as I used to be as a financial advisor, these ETFs offer the benefits of diversification in a relatively low cost structure in one trade to be able to get 30, 40, 50 names to get, to get your exposure. It, it's a really good concept. And Chris, it's pretty diverse business, you know. I mean, I, I suppose ESG is is a thematic type, but I'm not even talking about that. Uh, I broke it down three different ways. Global X had a report on this a little while ago. We could talk about fintech as a thematic thing. We can talk about uh, social media. We can talk about the gig economy. We could talk about climate change. We can talk about sustainability. I guess it breaks things down pretty easily, right? It does, and I think I think what people need to really grasp with thematic is it's not always about artificial intelligence. It's not always about you know electronic vehicles and things like that. Sometimes thematic can also include a way to express an overweight or an underweight in some cases to a particular sector. So we talk about broad-based passive indices like healthcare or energy or something along those lines. But if you want to overweight oncology, for example, you can find a thematic ETF that overweights those names. Uh, additionally, you can also look at other strategies like low vol. We talk about thematic low vol products. There's an S&P low vol index. There's our high yield uh, index IQ low vol ETF, which is HYLV. You also have uh, currency hedge products, which again, some, some funds are not currency hedged. Some are fully hedged and ours is 50% hedged. But that's also a thematic way of expressing your view in a broader index based world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, speaking of, of, of thematics, Todd, I, I sort of made a little joke about work from home. I said, when are we going to get a work from home ETF? And of course, we got one, uh, Direxion. And we had Dave Matza on just a few weeks ago talking about that. WFH is the symbol. And uh, you've noted this uh, as well. Right on cue. There it came. And uh, we've got almost $60 million in assets in a few weeks. It usually trades over 100,000 shares a day, which is what, five or six million uh, and here's some of the stocks that are in it. Uh, it's not bad considering it's only been around for, for, for three weeks. So there's obviously some serious interest in something uh, which, which sounds like a, a, a sort of in, invented idea. Let's buy work from home. But it seems to be working. It is. I mean, so we touched on cloud computing and cybersecurity as two of those themes. You get those within this ETF, but you also get other ones. Companies like Zoom would fall into a different of those subcategories. But you mentioned this is just three weeks old. It used to be investors would wait three years before buying an ETF. And then they started going into it earlier once they got a look at the underlying holdings. Three weeks is really impressive. It's a sign that this ETF has certainly resonated with investors. It, it, it hopes well for its future. Yeah, let me let me move on here because I want to hit on a couple of other topics today. Uh, I mentioned uh, we talked a lot last week, BlackRock reported. And uh, if you want to watch one stock as a company as an example of what's going on in the ETF space. Uh, this is certainly it. We saw the dominance of their number one uh, position overall. They have scale. They're the largest ETF provider 
uh, out there. They have a, a very strong brand name in the iShares. Uh, they're very diverse. They have passive index. They have active. They are, uh, they are the leader in the ESG space right now. Uh, and they've taken that playbook, uh, a page out of the Vanguard playbook, and kept fees as low as possible. Chris, I noted last week that their base rate, you know, sort of an average of what they might charge, was uh, 17 basis points. That's pretty remarkable when you consider that includes everything. But you can buy their IVV, their S&P 500, for three basis points. I mean, what, 15 years ago, a mutual fund was 100 to 125 basis points. You can buy the S&P 500 now for three basis points. That's, for you who don't know, it's $3 for a $10,000 investment. It's pretty remarkable, yeah. Chris. It, it's unbelievable. And it's great. It's great news for you and I and Todd, you know, and everyone else listening. Um, it's, it's a low cost way to get, again, those core assets allocated to broad base, you know, core allocations in the portfolio. Um, but, you know, look, iShares and Vanguard, they fight it out hard. You know, I make the reference a lot of times to Formula One. It's Mercedes versus Ferrari there. You know, you've got the, the top two, you know, performers there in terms of asset growth. Um, but then there's a pretty big field, you know, of other ETF issuers who are who are fighting for uh, maybe not so much a lion's share of the assets, but fighting more uh, for performance metrics, you know, for for uh, yeah. a way to diversify away from a broader index like S&P. They do charge a little more for that. Well, we're that's sure. why you see, yeah, that's why you see the actual base rate a little bit higher than where their core yeah. uh, where their core assets sit. Well, you're, we're putting up a full screen here that it shows. I mean, everyone's got inflows last quarter over the first quarter, uh, but some of the smaller ones like Arc Investment, uh, this is not shown here, but Nuveen and Amplify, they had big jumps up. And I know, Chris, you have made this point in the past. Uh, saying uh, that there's a difference between the managers who get the most assets, like BlackRock and Vanguard, and the managers who perform the best in their respective areas. I mean, Kathy Wood has gotten tremendous attention as an active manager in the ARC space. She had a huge position in Tesla that turned out to be correct. That fund's attracted a lot of money recently. So I think your point is well taken. It, while it's nice to see the big guys making, bringing in all this money, there are people doing very well uh, for very specific reasons, Chris. That's right. And I think a lot of it comes down to alpha generation above and beyond the core allocation. So how are managers, advisors, and, and you know wealth managers differentiating their clients' portfolios? They're going to always have a piece of those larger passive index-based products that are, that are so heavily you know, weighted towards iShares and Vanguard. But then when it comes to up-weighting and, and, and adding some alpha and adding some manager discretion, they're looking to people like Kathy Wood uh, and, and Nuveen and Index IQ and Amplify for, for, for different ways to differentiate the portfolio and, uh, and add some alpha. Yeah. Uh, Todd, uh, bottom line here is uh, money keeps throwing it, going into those particular funds. Um, but again, we should keep track of what's going on with the smaller ones as well. I don't want to simply say, you know, it's true 5%, uh, excuse me, the top five fund families particularly iShares and, and Vanguard, get 90% of all the assets under management. But there are other things out there to consider just besides how big they are, right? Right. So you've got 90% going to the or overall assets to those top five firms. According to CFRA's research, 82% of the flows have gone into those firms. So you've got more mid-sized firms you guys touched on ARC earlier. JP Morgan and PIMCO are doing really well within active fixed income. You've got uh, Global X with the thematic oriented ETFs. There are certainly other players, and depending upon if you want to specialize in certain themes, you want to look besides the, the top two firms. There's, there's some great firms that are out there offering compelling products. Yeah. Uh, let me move on here. I want to talk about bond ETFs. And we, how many times have we addressed this in the last two months? But money keeps coming into bond ETFs, particularly corporate bond ETFs, guys. And it's not just because the government is buying some corporate bond ETFs. Uh, I noted, uh, Todd, last week, Bloomberg noting first-time buyers of uh, BlackRock's iShares ETFs added $10 billion of inflows in the first half of 2020. That's not all, of course, government uh, money that's coming in here. And they're getting bigger, uh, uh, Todd, and, and with good reason. Why, why is money keep going into these funds, despite the fact that we're dealing with essentially very, very low returns, particularly, of well, course, well on the yields? 
We noted in a, a separate piece outside of that one that insurance companies in particular were increasingly using fixed income ETFs like LQD, among the other products. And they were actually buying in early March ahead of the Federal Reserve. It's not that they were market timing it. It's just they saw the benefits of liquidity, of price transparency. We saw bond mutual funds have relatively stale net asset values, whereas the ETFs were more real time in nature. You get diversification benefits, you get cash management benefits, and that's the institutional side of it. It trickles down towards the traditional retail investor who has tighter spreads, uh, benefits from the scale as the costs keep coming down. Fixed income ETFs are about half of the overall net inflows in 2020, despite being 20% of the overall ETF pie. They continue to punch above their weight, and I think that's really among the major stories of 2020 in, in ETF land. Yeah, yeah. And, and Chris, hey, I, I think the I, I think the, the key point here, Chris, I want to get your reaction to, to this point. I, I think the, the institutional buy, buyers realize how efficiently the ETF market has been pricing corporate bonds. You know, there used to be some debate about who's right when you get a difference between the prices and the net of the and the net asset values. And they would say, oh, well, these things are going to blow up because, you know, they're not going to be able to price them because the underlying bonds don't price very uh, accurately or quickly. It turned out, you know, it was the ETFs that were right. And, and don't you think institutional buyers have, have noticed that fact? I, I do. I think, I, I, look, I think, again, ETFs have held up really well in the, in the fixed income space, despite, you know, criticisms about uh, transparency on pricing of the underlying bonds. Um, however, you know, like you said, they have held up. And I think that the, there is, you mentioned yield, while the yields are low and we're seeing these inflows, there is still a need to own, you know, fixed income, whether it's high yield or whether it's investment grade. And people are still searching for yield. Now, right now, you know, there is sort of a – it feels like the market might be on a little bit of a hold in terms of whether spreads are going to continue to compress a little bit to get to those traditional levels in high yield and investment grade, or whether or not as we, as we ease into this year, into the back half of the year, the spreads might widen out again. With that sort of press, uh, preset there – you might want to start thinking about yeah. where you're going to watch this fixed income asset growth uh, go. Is it going to move from investment grade to high yield, high yield to investment grade, or are people going to reduce volatility in those sectors? Well, we know what's going to happen here. If the market keeps going up and the volatility stays down, they'll migrate towards high yield. I mean, that's been the story. That everybody's just desperately uh, going towards uh, higher risk, uh, high yield funds. Let me just move on here uh, and talk about the IPO market because it's doing great. Uh, and we had a huge potential IPO announcement today. Jack Ma's uh, Ant Financial, which is the number one fintech company in the world right now, let's face it. Uh, it's a subsidiary, essentially, uh, of, uh, of Alibaba. They're kicking off their their IPO, but not in New York and not in London. They're going to do it in Hong Kong and they're going to do it in Shanghai and on the uh, on the tech exchange uh, in Shanghai over there. Uh, guys, uh, either one of you take a crack at this, but I think there are two important stories here. First, it's not New York or London. And I think there are that's the result of some real geopolitical tensions uh, that exist. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's huge. I mean, they're talking about 20 north of 20 billion dollars here. If that is the case, this could be the second or third biggest IPO uh, of, of all time here. I mean, number one, of course, remains Saudi Aramco at 25 billion. Alibaba's at 21. But if Ant Group goes over to 22, it could be the second or third biggest in the world. You get the idea here. U.S. visas way down there at 17 billion. So I guess, um, uh, Todd, um, your thoughts on that. And, and how do you play this? I mean, how would it, investors get in, into international IPOs in an ETF space? So the IPO ETF space is relatively limited. IPO, the ticker IPO, is one way of doing it for U.S. exposure. The firm Renaissance also offers an ETF, IPOS, that is the international companies that have gone public within the recent period of time. About half of its assets is focused on China. So it's logical that this is the ETF that's first uh, to get exposure to it. But then again, this is likely to be added into those broad emerging market ETFs or, or China-specific ETFs. And you can get IEMG and VWO, the two heavyweights within the emerging market space, to get exposure to it at some point. And you'd likely assume it'll be in China ETFs like MCHI uh, and GXC once it makes it past the criteria. But it's very interesting to see that this right. is not going to be a U.S. listed company. Yeah, well, I that's think what I find most interesting. 
Yeah, there will be a delay. Sorry, Chris. Uh, Todd, it won't, it won't happen right away. I think if anyone has the ability to do it quickly, it's, it's to your point, Renaissance. Uh, but the broader indices, we, you know, look, just like any other big company, you know, that, that meets the criteria for index inclusion, uh, we expect something of this size and this magnitude would be up for consideration, probably, you know, in, in, a, in the fastest order of time possible to be included in indices. And then all of those passive indexes that Todd alluded to, all those that ETFs that track those indices will right. be having to add that name. Um, if it's allowed, right. again, there's been a lot of chatter so about whole... what might or might not be allowed going into the second half of this year. So, right. So that's it's... my point. The whole IPO thing with China has gotten dragged into all these geopolitical issues around the, the trade wars, around coronavirus. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they're not listing in, in New York or London at all. I, I think there is obvious uh, political pressure on some of these companies over there to list over here. They may not feel welcome here. There are still companies coming from China, uh, but they're certainly not on the level of ant, uh, financial. I wonder, guys, is, is the U.S. missing out on something uh, at, at this point? If we deliberately drove people away or is this, you know, sort of the way the cookie crumbles when you're dealing with uh, the fallout from geopolitical tensions. Well, I, think I think this I is think just. You'll see, yeah, there'll Chris. be an opportunity for U.S. investors to, you know, to find ways and to find vehicles overseas to, you know, to get access if they absolutely need to uh, get access to a security like this. But to your point, um, you know, look, the, the geopolitical tensions are definitely going to be an issue, you know, going forward, and that's something to keep a very close eye on. Last word yeah, to you the there, Todd. Are, I'm sorry, just to jump in quickly. This is the benefit of what ETFs offer for U.S. listed investors to get exposure to harder to access uh, international markets, particularly like China. So even though it won't list here for an individual stock perspective, U.S. ETF investors are the winner again and again and again. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely the case. That's it for this week, guys. Thanks very much for joining us. We get the best guests here. Todd and Chris, thanks very much for joining us. And that does it for this week's ETF Edge. And of course, as always, you can see all of our videos, etfedge.cnbc.com. And don't forget the ETF Edge podcast, where we go into a little more depth about things like net asset values and prices of ETFs. Get a little nerdier and explain things for you. Don't miss that one as well. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.